All right, thank you. Who's ever seen the film The Karate Kid? The original one, not the new one. All right, a few less. OK, it doesn't really matter. I, I haven't seen the new one, but I, I think the story is the same. Basically, I'm going to run you through it, the principle of the, of the start of the film. There's a boy called Daniel. And now Daniel, his parents have just divorced. And they move to a new area away from his father. And they go to a poor area and they have to move to a new school. And he's trying to fit in and he's not really getting on with it very well. So what happens is he starts getting bullied. And he's trying to fit in. It, it doesn't go very well at all. And these bullies, he thinks, I need to defend myself. So he goes to the library, gets some books on karate. Thinks, right, I'll learn karate, and I'm going to go and kick these boys' asses. So he's there in the kitchen, and he's learning these moves. And he goes to school after the weekend with his new knowledge of karate. And the guys kick his ass again. You think, fuck, come on, I just learned karate. So he takes more books out, different studies on karate by different people, and he studies these the next weekend at home. He's going through the movements. So next week he goes back to school again, really cocky. I've got more karate this time, I'll be fine. He gets his ass kicked again. It turns out that the one person that becomes his friend is the girlfriend of the, the bad boy bully, who just so happens to be also a karate champion. So it's no wonder he's getting his ass kicked every day. She invites him to go to a school disco, as we used to call it in the 80s, dressed as a shower curtain at Halloween. Because as a shower curtain, no one could see who he is. He's just hiding behind there. And when the rest of them find out that he's there at the dance at all. They're not very pleased, so they take him outside, and this time they're going to really, like, for want of a better expression, fuck him up, as we say in London. So they take him outside, and they give him a good hiding, also an English phrase, and this old Okinawan man named Mr. Miyagi just so happens to be passing at this time. And as he does, he steps in. And he deals with the bullies and protects Daniel. And he sends them on their way. So Daniel naturally says, please help me. Please teach me what you just did to those boys. And Mr. Miyagi says, yes, I will. I will help you defend yourself. I will give you the tools to defend yourself against any bullies by using karate. Come to my house tomorrow morning. And in exchange for karate lessons, I am going to give you some chores to do around my house. So Daniel, excited, the next day, turns up to the house, eager, knocks on the door. I've come for my karate lessons. And Mr. Miyagi says, wait, before I teach you karate, I need you to do a few things around the house for me as kind of payment for helping you out last night and for giving you some lessons. So if you could start by polishing my cars for me, now, Mr. Maggie's got classic cars. They've got to be polished and waxed very carefully and in a very specific manner. He instructs Daniel to go to each car, 20 cars, he wasn't expecting that, and to wax the polish on like this with one hand and to wax the polish off with the other hand, like this. 20 cars, classic cars. It takes him a week to complete this task. So tired, but still excited, he comes back to Mr. Miyagi at the end of the week and says, polish your cars, <laughs> can I have my karate lessons now? And Mr. Miyagi says, yeah, come back Monday and we'll start. So the weekend goes past, Daniel comes back again Monday morning, eager, and he says, can we start our karate lessons? Mr. Miyagi says, yeah, yeah, we can start that, but I really need your help with something first before we do the karate lessons. Can you sand down my decking in the, gar in the garden? He's basically creating this lovely Japanese garden next to these like warehouse estates. So it needs a lot of work and he's got a lot of decking in, in like an acre worth of land. So Daniel's out there on his hands and knees with a little block with sandpaper on it, scrubbing, and he has to do it very specifically, again, in tiny circles, this time tiny circles, like this. So he goes round. This takes him another week. 
and still no karate lessons yet. Well, after the end of the second week, he comes back and says, right, I've done your cars, I've done your decking, can I please have some karate lessons? And Mr. Miyagi says, yes, you can, but I've got some people coming next week and I've got to paint the fence, it's really urgent. Do you think you could do it over the weekend? Oh, come on, I've polished your cars, I've done your decking, right? now the fence. Okay, 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 you did save me and you're going to give me karate lessons, I will paint your fence for you. Once again, Mr. Miyagi says, I want it done a specific way. So he gives him this white paint and he's to go around the whole perimeter of the area, bending his knees and lifting the brush up once with his right hand, once with his left hand, before moving across and doing the next panel all the way around the garden. Another week goes past. Daniel is more than a little annoyed at this point that he's not received any karate lessons. And he storms up to Mr. Maggie's house and he raps on the door. Hey! Sound effects? No one's there. But he sees a note on the floor from Mr. Miyagi saying, I had to go away. I'm very sorry. We'll start your lessons when I get back. And while I'm gone, can you paint my house for me? <laughs> so it's one of those, a bit like a, a finished summer cottage. It's got panels. And he wants him to paint it like this. He's written diagrams for him with his hands, side to side, like this. Reluctantly, he does it because he's not there to argue with. And when Mr. Miyagi returns a few days later, Daniel is waiting on the doorstep, bucked off, to be honest with you. He's not pleased. He's done all this work and got nothing in return. Mr. Miyagi turns up and he says, Oi, you're going to give me a karate lesson right now. So he goes, OK, then. Um, sand the floor and throws a punch at him. Daniel just immediately blocks it, but he doesn't know how. And he goes, OK, paint the fence. And he does this, and he blocks another punch. And then Mr. Maggie comes at him with a series of kicks and punches, and Daniel blocks every single one of them. And Mr. Maggie says to Daniel, I've given you the tools to defend yourself. You didn't even think about that. I threw a punch at you, and you just naturally had it in you to defend yourself. And that's what I said I was going to do. I was going to help you defend yourself. There you go, there's your karate lesson. Stunned. Daniel stunned. He didn't realise that all this work he'd been doing was literally to build up muscle memory in order to be a more efficient karate expert. Sorry, that was Kung Fu. Karate expert. And it's much the same, <laughs> I think you know where I'm going with this, as public speaking. Let's take the public out of this for a second, okay? Because that's out of your hands. What is speaking? Can anyone answer that question? If you don't know what speaking is, you're probably in the wrong fucking room. <laughs> Communicating, okay. That's an, yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. Or not. Okay, storytelling. These are all kind of ideas about speaking and what you can be used for. But what is speaking? Okay. Who's seen Harry Potter? I know you have. Okay, right. Uh, so what does Harry Potter do? Cast spells. Cast spells, right. Now, the word spelling, spell comes from spelling. Spelling, the word spelling in English history anyway, comes from the act of writing down, transcribing the phonetic sounds of what someone is saying. It is the transcription itself, the word spelling. That's how it originates. But the word spell comes directly and the spell itself is the speaking. So everything you say is a spell. And the reason I tell you that is because breath feeds an impulse to thought, which drives a need to communicate, which then uses the same air to vibrate our vocal folds, formulate sound, resonate within us, articulate as words, creating new vibrations, aka spells, out into the world. Therefore, breath is fucking important to speaking. 
and speaking is a physical deed. We are creating things when we speak. We are creating vibrations. Now, they can be vibrations and words for good to help, or they can be disasters. They can be curses of evil to hurt and destroy, as we all know. Some people tell you that body language is 60%, and that tone is 20%, and that speaking is just 7%, but that's not true. Because some of the greatest speeches you've ever heard was on the radio. And you couldn't see people's body language when you heard them. Most people have been scripted as they're saying it, with in front of them. That's powerful. The ability to articulate words clearly and concisely is good speaking. And it's a physical thing. If you can do that, you don't have to worry about your public because you're doing your fucking job. It's as simple as that. So anyone who feels a bit scared about public speaking, you're not scared of the speaking part. That's just technical. You just do things that will make you a better speaker. And once you are a better speaker, you will realize from the response you get as you speak, people understand you and you have no fear for the audience. Okay, so the most important fundamental part of this to take away, and I'm gonna give you it right now, is breath. The first thing we do when we're born is to breathe. The first action we take is to inhale the vital nutrients from our environment. The last thing we do before we die is to breathe out. We exhale and let go one final time. On average, we breathe about 16 times per minute. That's 960 times an hour, 23,000 times a day. Um, and the global I think lifespan in 2019 is 80 years. So if we breathe eight and a half million times a year, over the course of seven, 80 years, we will have circulated seven billion breaths. It's fundamental to life. We can go for three weeks without food, three days without water, but we can't go for more than three minutes without these vital nutrients, oxygen, nitrogen from the air. It's also fundamental, like I said before, to the voice. So let's stand up for a second. We don't need a pen and paper for this. Many of you, has anyone here ever done any acting classes before? Okay, any singing classes, anyone? Okay. There's a lot of information passed down from singer and actor to other people, and it wasn't until I became a vo voice coach that I realized some of that information isn't as helpful as you might think if you're not in the room to guide someone with it. A lot of people will tell you that diaphragmic breathing is breathing into the belly. But what, what happens to me as I breathe into my belly? Do you see my back? I'm putting my posture out of alignment. And for someone who's not in the room to guide me through that, that's actually quite detrimental to your breathing. Because the intercostal muscles, the muscles of your ribs, are more important and they need to expand in order to let air in. They function to allow air to drop into your body, your machine. And this is feeding your machine. We all know that you shouldn't breathe high in your chest, but also breathing into your belly without guidance. Unless you're a singer, opera singer specifically, it's not so healthy. So what we're going to do, we're going to learn how to breathe properly right here and now. Okay? This point here, just above your coccyx, bottom of your spine, you can feel it, just above your bum. Work it. Okay, this is called the sacral area. There's five, <laughs> there's five vertebrae there. And the sacrum, this area, is the first part of you that's born in the womb. It's born, <laughs> that grows, that forms in the womb. It's the oldest part of you there is, essentially. Every time you breathe in, for now, it's an exercise. It'd be hard to carry with you, otherwise you'd be walking in, into crossroads, into cars and walls. I want you to imagine the air hits that spot first. Just imagine it. And if the air hits that spot first, it's going to start rising. Now, if you can also imagine that inside your torso is a balloon. What happens to a balloon as it expands? It expands in all directions. Okay, but if we imagine it hits the bottom of the balloon, then back out to the side, and this balloon is within our torso, breathe in. That's the easy part. The difficult part is imagining that as you breathe out, 
the balloon continues to expand. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. And see it through as well. I don't think we've got time for all of the science today. But this is doing a few things for you. Um, if you do this five minutes before you go to bed, you will sleep better. If you do this first thing in the morning, you'll probably have a more productive day. If you ever feel fearful or forget words you have to speak as you're speaking, drop down, do this exercise, breathe into your back, into the sacrum. The words will come back to you and you'll be back on course. Simple as that. If you're losing energy throughout the day at work and coffee's not doing it because it's really not, do some breathing. Feed yourself what you need, okay? Have you got that? It also helps, but again, time, if you have your feet facing forward underneath your hips, your knees are unlocked, not straight, unlocked, and your pelvis is not forward or pushed out, but somewhere in the middle. And if you imagine this point here, your sternum has a string being pulled up. Don't pull your shoulders back, pull your chest up. And your shoulders, when you breathe out, will drop down. Lean forward so the weight is evenly spread across all of your toes and feet, the whole area of your feet. This we call neutral in acting. And if you breathe in this position, you look fantastic right now, by the way. <laughs> Not that you didn't do before. Okay? This is a great position to stand in if ever you don't want to be judged by your own storytelling, which you may not know about, because it just takes away all the story. Okay, that's, that's good enough for that one. Thank you. But do it before you go to bed and do it before you wake up. Not finished yet. <laughs> okay, right. Um, it's quite interesting as uh, people sit down again. This is what happens. Posture, it's really important to you as a, as a physiological machine and as a speaker. Um, it's worth, worth noting. We're going to look a bit at that now.